And um, I want us to really take heed to what we're going to look at in the book of Jude, because as we go along, as uh, we get closer and closer to uh, our Lord's return, is the way things get, <clears throat> these, these verses are going to become more real uh, <clears throat> the things that we face and look at, I believe, than maybe we've ever seen before. So tonight, Jude, again, chapter 1, verse 12. These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees who fruit, whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Thank you, Father, for your holy and precious word. <clears throat> Guide us, direct us. Help us tonight, Father, and please give us what we need. We pray in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all can be seated. All right, verse 12. These are spots in your feast of charity. Who's he talking about? Well, he's talking about those in verse 4. There are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turned the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. These are men that creep in to the lives, the homes, the churches of the saints. One of the things that identify them is ungodliness. And you need to remember that. Ungodliness. They turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. Now, brethren, that's why the Internet is so dangerous, because you can't see someone's life. You hear their teaching, but you can't see their life. And these, these, these false teachers, these that creep in, they are, they are ungodly men. They're ungodly. And you can't tell if someone's godly or ungodly without being able to examine their life. Look at verse number 8. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Verse 10, But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally is brute beasts, and those things that corrupt themselves, woe unto them, for they have gone to the way of Cain, the way of religion, versus salvation, uh, the way of uh, religion in the sense of trying to get to heaven by their own efforts instead of trusting the finished work of Christ. And ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward, hirelings, hirelings, not called of God, but preaching or teaching for hire, and perished in the gainsaying of Cori, the rebellious. Now, tonight, verse 12, these, that's the ones, the ones of verse 4, verse 8, verse 10, 11, these are spots in your feast of charity. So they're said to be spots. A spot is defined in the dictionary as a mark or a substance made by foreign matter. Something that soils purity. It's defined as a disgrace, a blemish. Spots they are. Um, <clears throat> go to Acts 8 just a moment. Acts 8. Acts 8. Acts chapter 8. Verse 18. Now... They're religious. They are religious. They like to get around the things of God. They like to participate in the activities of the things of the church. But they are unregenerate. They are not saved. All right. Acts 8. Look at verse number 18. <clears throat> Acts 8. And uh, let me get over there. I'm sorry. I stopped. Sure. Acts 8 and verse number 18. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Now, this Simon had made a profession. He believed and was baptized, but he had not received the Holy Ghost yet. This was a transition time. The apostles had not laid hands on him, and he had not received the Holy Ghost. His heart wasn't right. He had made profession. He had been baptized, but his heart was not right. Saying, give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, thy money perish with thee. Because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. 
Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. <clears throat> Simon the sorcerer. He wanted to get involved with religious things. He wanted the power and prominence and popularity. So he made an outward profession, was baptized, but his heart was not right. So when he came to receive the new birth, the gift of the Holy Ghost, he never got it. He never got it because Peter saw what was going on. His heart wasn't right in the sight of God. The Bible says in Jude, these are spots in your feast of charity. They're marks, they're blemishes on your feast of charity. Now, these feasts of charity, the way they're described, would evidently be the Lord's Supper. Evidently be the Lord's Supper. Go back to what it says. Jude 1 verse 12. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. So this tends to lend itself towards the Lord's Supper because what other kind of feast, what other kind of supper could you enter into where you had to be fearful with it? There's only one that I know of in the Bible that you had better enter into uh, a, a meal a, uh, a a ceremonial observance that you better do so uh, with fear and trepidation, very carefully. And that's the Lord's Supper. Take your Bible, uh, go to 1 Corinthians 11. They didn't have any compunction. No problem at all. They were un- unregenerate, they're lost. They'd participate like no problem at all. Look here, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. Brethren, may God forbid that we ever come together for the worse and not for the better. May we always be bettered, whether we, brethren, whether we come together as a body or whether we visit one another. Brethren, don't leave each other dragged down or discouraged or despot. Leave each other better than you came. But when you visit each other, leave each other spiritually better off than when you came. Uh, verse 18, for first of all, when uh, ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. In other words, brother, they were misusing the Lord's Supper. Like just a regular meal. And they would go ahead and eat. And somebody didn't have food with them. And everybody went went and ate. And and some would be uh, left hungry. And some would be almost in in an uproarious, riotous manner. And they were not discerning the Lord's body and taking it in a right manner. Verse 22. What? Have you not houses to eat and drink in? Brethren, not that a church can't come together to fellowship. But brethren, when you come together to fellowship, that's a time to fellowship that is not to observe the Lord's Supper. There are distinct differences between the two. All right? Or despise you the church of God and shame them that have not. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. This is not eternal damnation. But people think that damnation always means hell. And no, damnation simply in the dictionary just means punishment. Eternal damnation, right, is hell. But damnation is punishment. These were saved people, but they were eating and drinking the Lord's Supper in the wrong manner. And they were eating and drinking damnation to themselves. Now look what it says, verse 30. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Because they were taking the Lord's Supper in the wrong manner, and they were truly saved, some of them were sick, and some of them already died. But if, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together under condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. 
So Paul said, look, make a distinction. Don't, when you get together to have a meal, that's not to take the Lord's Supper. Because you're, you're thinking more of your appetite than discerning the Lord. So when you're eating just to eat, and, and, and nothing wrong with eating to eat. God made food to be good and to, and, to, and to satisfy hunger. But you're not thinking of the Lord. You're thinking of your appetite. There's a time to do that. And there's a time to commemorate the Lord's death, His, His, His death, His body, and His blood. All right? And to commemorate that. And Paul said, you're getting them mixed together and you're suffering because of it. You're getting punished because of it. All right? So there's a distinction there. So, brethren, again, the Lord's Supper is not to be observed to satisfy appetite but to commemorate our Lord's death, body, and blood. But these, these in Jude, the book of Jude, they were spots in the Feast of Chad. They were feeding themselves without fear. Right. Ain't no big deal. Brethren, a, a saved person should pause and give thought and uh, examine herself. That they know the Lord, sure. that everything's... Where it ought to be, nothing uh, that particularly outstanding that they know of that needs to be taken care of and, and, and observe it in a reverent manner, thinking of the body and blood of the Lord and the price that He paid, considering Him. But these, they're not saved. They're charlatans. They're religious. They're lost. They got no problem at all. Well, I'll take it in a minute. They don't think nothing, nothing about it at all. And if, and brother, if nothing happens to them, <laughs> it's because they're not saved. For those that are saved, as we see in Acts, that's a serious thing to, to take the Lord's Supper in a wrong manner, in a wrong fashion. So they feed themselves without fear. Uh, notice what it says uh, next. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds. They're lost. You see, they're clouds without water. Rather than a cloud without water, it looks promising, but it has nothing. They have no substance. They don't have the Spirit of God. They are blown about by winds. See, so look at the clouds. A cloud that doesn't drop rain. It looks promising. It doesn't have anything. You ever see them blown about by winds? Clouds will blow here. Clouds will blow there. These, these, these ones spoken of, all right, they don't have the Spirit of God. They are blown about by winds. They're blown about by unclean spirits and by false doctrine. They are unsettled. They never get settled in a local church. I'm just telling you. Unsettled. But that's the picture. They're just blown about the winds. Whatever is the latest wind to blow up, it carries them. It carries them. They're unset, they're unsettled, they're unsettled. And they don't have any substance to them. They look promising, they can talk a good talk. They don't have anything. And they're blown about. And brother, today with the internet, oh my. Blown here, blown there. If you don't want me uh, railing on the internet, then uh, you guess you better pray that uh, God doesn't get me around people. That because I'm telling you, I just keep getting this thing reinforced. I've, I've recently run into individual just almost subverted by the stuff they picked up. Just I mean, just just it, rather that stuff will subvert you. And you'll get blown about and chase this thing and chase that and chase this. It'll consume your time and pretty soon you're called up. Brethren, local, brethren, I'm not saying this because I'm a local church pastor. I'm saying it because it's the truth. Brethren, the local church, that's the medium that God has set up for you to grow by, to be assembled with, to be a local, to be a testimony of the Lord in your local area. You can't, I can't emphasize it enough. But these Clouds they are, without water, carried about of winds. Again, they never get settled in. Go to Proverbs 25. Proverbs 25. Proverbs 25. Proverbs 25. Verse 14. Whoso boasteth himself of a false gift is like what? 
clouds and wind without rain. Ties right in. What's the false gift that they boast of? Salvation. They claim to have it. They boast themselves of it. But that crowd in the book of Jude, they're not saved. As we're going to see, they are not saved. They boast of having the gift of salvation, but they do not have it. And they are blown about like clouds and winds without rain. They look promising. They know the terms. They know what to say. But not because they have it internally. They've learned to speak the lingo. They've learned to speak the lingo, but they don't have it internally. And they're just blown about by all kind of things. Take your Bible, go to 2 Peter 2. 2 Peter 2. <clears throat> Years ago, there was uh, a family that had come to church. And Sarah and I spent some time with them. They had uh, come from an independent Baptist church somewhere. Uh, out of the area, and uh, were very active and very involved there. Brother Sarah and I, brother, I'll be honest with you. If you think that I go around second guessing people and looking at people, believe it or not, brethren, if somebody tells me they're saved, I take them at the word. I honestly do. If somebody tells me that they're saved, unless I see something different that's glaring, I assume that they are. Really, I'm not going around looking. But brethren, I can't help it, and I hope you can't help it neither, when warning signals and sirens go off in your head. Something just... Something seemed to miss. One little warning sign that goes off, usually in my head, is if the woman is the main speaker. When the woman is the main speaker... And the man's the background, and she's the one making spiritual choices. Okay, warning signals go off. But then, when talk is mainly about activities, but when it gets down to spiritual things, right. or you've been in church a long time, and there's, and there's no spiritual... I get concerned. I don't go around going, well, they're lost. I don't do that. I go pray. And I don't pray haughtily. I don't pray arrogantly. I don't pray because I think I'm... I pray because I'm concerned. Because something is amiss. All right? And once again, it's, look, look, look. Phil's mom and dad, Phil and Vano prayed for them, worked with them. We did in this church. When they moved up to New Jersey, Brother Phil as a good son and trying to do the best he could and trying, tried to find them a Bible-believing church to go to. They went. Next thing you know, they've answered the questions, been baptized and pronounced saved. But there was no evidence that there was salvation there. Right. Right. Then, yeah. I'm not just... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you tried to make it there, you couldn't. There was just something, but you know what? It was a travesty. It was a travesty what was done. It was a travesty what was done. When Phil's fault, my goodness, he's trying to do the right thing. Try to find church for mom and dad to go to. And try. But brethren, once again, everything has been so become a formula and a method. It's just like out of out of out of a grinder. Spit them out. Spit them out. Spit them out. Brethren, when, 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 uh, when there are things that are glaring, some, we need to notice that and pray. Not that you get cynical, not that you go, hmm. I, think, I know some people tell you, you don't believe anybody's saved. Brethren, I told you, somebody tells me they're born, I believe them. I take it that they are. But if something is not clicking, I'm going to pray. Because I'm concerned. And I know what we're looking at today. Look, Second Peter 2 verse 17. These are wells without water. Clouds that are carried with a tempest. Man, that's the same kind of stuff. You, hey, a warning is being given. Second Peter, book of Jude, Proverbs. Well, there's something there in the latter times. As we get close to the book of Revelation, right? So there's a warning being given. 
to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. They're lost. They're religious. They know the right phrases. They can regurgitate. They can spit the stuff out. They're, as long as there's activities, they're very... But as far as having something spiritual to them. Friend, you know it's like when you got saved? The lights are on and you're like, yeah, you know, there's a spiritual communion and you get spiritual principles. You get it. You got it. But it's like, it's, it's just not there. It's just not there. Brethren, don't ha- I don't want to hear it about, about well, they just, need to, they just need to be discipled. Oh, please. I understand discipleship's important, but if you've got the Holy Ghost, something spiritual should be there. Brethren, if you've got the Holy Ghost, something spiritual should be there, has to be there. You know what? So the Lord goes and, and sends Philip to that eunuch, right? And he gets saved and goes merrily on his way. What? No time to discipleship? He's got the Holy Ghost. He's got the Word of God. Lord will take care. Brethren, the, the excuse is made for this crowd. that Well, they're just not getting discipled. I understand the importance of that. But if you've got the Holy Ghost, if you've got the Holy Ghost and the Word of God, God's Spirit's going to bear witness. And there's going to be something spiritual there. That's what concerns me. Take your Bible. Go to Ephesians 4. <clears throat> Ephesians 4. Look at verse 14. That we be henceforth no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about by what? With every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men. That's what a magician does, you know. Slight of hand. Those guys are good. You ever seen one of them them deals on them pickpockets that will will take everything off you and you standing right there and almost tell you what he's going to do and do it anyway? That's something. Slide of hand. They're quick. They're good. They'll do it. Brother, there's people out there that will do that to you spiritually. And cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. They affect, listen, they affect those who truly are saved. And especially those who are only religious. They get cared about with every wind of doctrine. Whatever blows up some new thing, some different thing, they're ready to follow it. Take your Bible to 1 Timothy 4. <clears throat> They definitely, um, again, they don't like anything that deals with the heart. If you'll give them checklist Christianity, if you'll give them activity, if you'll give them something physically that they can do, they'll conform to anything they can do in their own power. But when it comes to having things having to do with the Spirit of God, they're lost. They can't. They're, 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 they're lost also in the sense of they don't know what to do because they don't have the Spirit of God. <clears throat> but they'll be very, uh, they don't want anything touching the heart. Anything that'll get near the heart. Anything that makes them feel nervous. I, brethren, I saw this from the time I first started pastoring. I remember, I remember, I remember there'd be people, had some individuals come to church when we first started out. Again, very involved, very active in the church they were in. But I could, I didn't. Warning signs, ding, 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 ding. But I considered the person saved. I took them as saved. But I was concerned. And sure enough, and sure enough, the individual that I'm thinking of right now came to the realization that he was not saved. And, and, and needed to be born again. He came to on his own. Not me pointing it out. Just trying. Well, why? By, by trying to emphasize the Word of God and the Spirit of God, they realized I ain't got something. There's something I don't have. And the churches they had been in, because they were merely a faithful, warm body, they got assigned stuff. That's how it goes, brethren. If you are faithful and a warm body and show up at least three times a month, you're going to be assigned something. Shoot, don't make your sister pastor deacon. I'm telling you, so I'm, and so what happens is they put this individual in charge of a lot of stuff. Put him in charge of a lot of stuff. Teaching and all kinds of stuff. See, brethren, all you got to do is go to the local Christian bookstore 
or whatever or whatever your church uses for you and you get the packet of stuff and you don't have to have spirituality. But if you go there, you either have the Spirit of God to guide you or you don't. If you're going to take nothing but the Bible, it's going to show. Either you have the Spirit of God to guide and direct you to where you can receive understanding that you can you can put it forth, and when it's put forth, you can receive it, or you don't. Amen. But if you get a certain manual that says, do it this way, you can do that. And this individual did. In fact, this individual, there was a young lady at our church. There was a young lady at our church at the time, and she came and she, she said, I remember him. She said, he, he, he was in one of the Sunday school classes at another church I went to, and a little girl came out from the class and had candy. And I asked her where she got the candy. And she said, I went back there and I answered questions and they gave me candy. Next Sunday, who wants to be saved? You know, she like, so she wanted, She said, I wanted to get the candy. So I went back. They questioned me. I said yes to the answers. They told me I was saved and they gave me the candy. He was the guy that did He was one of the ones that did that. He got, he got, he got saved. The problem was, he was doing what he was taught. And brethren, if people have no background of spirituality and truth, they think, well, that's what you do. That's how, that's, how, that's, that's how you do it. That's how you do it. And so, that brethren, I'm telling you, folks, we've produced a system that is so easy for a person to lie to themselves and fool themselves. And go through the motions. And, and, and never realize or be afraid to realize that, that I, don't, I don't have what they've got. There was a lady in, our, there was a lady in the church. And, and her husband was pretty bad off. And in comparison, she looked pretty good. She had made profession. Shoot, everybody does. And <clears throat> so she felt pretty good about herself. She felt especially compared to him. He ended up getting right with God and really living for God. And she realized, I remember, the, I remember the Sunday she got saved. I just preached on uh, uh, Samuel. He did not yet know the word of the Lord. And I looked up, and on the look on her face, I thought to myself, I think she just got saved. But I didn't say anything. And I went by, and she said, I think I just got saved. And, she, and what, but what had happened was, she had felt pretty good until her husband got right. And she realized He's got something I ain't got. I've been, I've been living better outwardly, but now he's got something inside I ain't got. And it helped to discover herself. All right, look here. 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Carried about. Different winds, different stuff. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having the conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you better watch that crowd that starts um, looking like they're on another spiritual plane based on their diet. Eat what you feel good about, fine and dandy, but you better watch that thing by tying in your spiritual, uh, th that your physical diet with your level of spirituality. You better watch that thing. Look, uh, verse 5, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of a good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained. What's going to happen in the latter times? People blown about of winds, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. What's supposed to keep us centered and aligned is time of the Word of God, prayer, the Scriptures, and local church. Pastor, what do you do if a local church is not putting forth? You get where you need to be. I'm serious about that. You get where you need to be. Look here. Take your Bible. Go to 1 John 4. <clears throat> Read that internet. It's, it's a tool. It's a tool. Oh, you better be careful with that tool. I know I've used this analogy before, but it bears repeating here. 
You know, tools are good things. Handsaw, hammer, you know. Um, but then they came out and they got power tools. Nothing wrong with a power tool. You get a lot more done. I've known men, I knew some, I knew guys who said, man, I don't even know how to use a hammer no more. I use a nail gun so much, I don't know how to use a hammer. And a power saw. They're really, they're really uh, good tools. A lot done. But you better, you got to be a lot more careful with a power tool. You can toss a saw aside and you might nick yourself with it, but you know. And you can toss a hammer down and you might mash your toe a little bit if you ain't careful what you do with it or hit your finger, you know. But you mess up with a power saw and you'll lose a limb or you'll die. You mess up with a nail gun and it's just like you got hit with a bullet. You're liable to die. Brethren, power tools can be great tools. But there is an inherent danger with them more so than other things. And you have got to be extra careful. And you do not let your kids play around. Have you ever seen anybody get around power tools and act irresponsible? Throw them around, still running, almost cut the cord in two. You ever seen somebody irresponsible? It's like, if you're smart, you stay away from them. Because they're going to get somebody hurt. Brethren, listen, the internet is a, is a power tool. It's a tool. It's a tool. But the potential for danger is phenomenal. And if you let your kids play around, you, listen, you'd be safe for letting them play with a power saw. You say, well, well I'll get them killed. Internet's a lot of kill their soul, man. In the sense of destroy them spiritually. You've got to be careful. It's a tool. But power tools have an inherent danger to them that you have got to be careful about. If people would be, how many people are like, Tell her children, almost on pain of death. Don't you get near that saw. Don't you get near that. I got it. I got it. Right. Good. Put the fear in them. But with the internet, it's like, all right, kind of, and things get in and man, hooks get put in them. Be careful. First John four, verse one, <laughs> beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits where they're of God, because many false prophets are going out in the world. Hereby know you the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the, is not, come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, wherever you heard that should come, but even now already is it in the world. Try the spirits where they're of God. Real quick, somebody pointed out, they said, you know, a computer and the Internet uh, make good servants but deadly masters. That's very true. All right, look here. Go back to the book of Jude. <clears throat> book of Jude. <clears throat> look what it says in verse number 12. These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds there are without water, carried them of winds. Look how they're described next. Trees whose fruit withereth. Trees whose fruit withereth. What happens? Their fruit is no good. It withers. Go to Matthew 7. Matthew 7. Matthew 7, verse 16. <clears throat> well, look at verse 15 real quick. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but then they are ravening wolves. Okay. But I heard last week, I was told of two fairly well-known individuals who kind of laughingly made comments about themselves and said that they were, uh, they were preachers. Uh, and they said that they were, uh, um, sheeps, sheep in wolves, uh, no, they were, uh, wool, uh, no, sheep in wolves clothing. Because they kind of were known to be kind of rough and hard. Brethren, that's foolish. First of all, you shouldn't be that. And you should be ashamed of it. Well, ha, 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 I guess I'm, I'm a sheep in wolf's clothing. That's pathetic. What are you bragging about? You got a problem. Well, oh, 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 come on, man. You're, uh, lay off. Tell you, uh, you're taking things too serious. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. That's shameful. Taint funny. Taint funny. 
And you know what? When you make a statement like that, you're not kidding. Secretly, you take pride in that. Most likely, secretly, you take a little pride in it. You like it. It's not right. It's not right. Look here. Verse 16. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their doctrine, ye shall know them. <laughs> I know that counts. Look what it says. Wherefore, by their fruits, by their fruits, by their fruits, ye shall know them. <laughs> by their fruits. Brethren, you better look at the fruit. You better look at the fruit of their life. Listen, um, cor- the Lord Jesus Christ speaks here in verse 18 and 17 of corrupt tree, corrupt tree, uh, uh, and the, the fruit it brings forth. The word corrupt is defined in the dictionary as tainted, unsound, changed from a sound to a putrid state. It means, uh, the word wither means to fade, to fade, to waste, to dry. So the Bible says of them that they, uh, uh, their fruit, is, uh, whose trees, whose fruit withereth, so, brethren, they're bad trees and bad ground. Go to Isaiah 60. Bad trees. Isaiah 60. Jesus said a corrupt tree doesn't bring forth good fruit. As you go into Isaiah 60, real quick, real quick, back there to Matthew 7. Every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither does the corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. By the fruit ye shall know them. A good tree, good fruit, corrupt tree, corrupt fruit. So they're bad trees. Look at Isaiah 60, verse 21. Thy people also shall be all righteous. They shall inherit the land forever. The branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. Brethren, if someone is not a work of God, a product of the Holy Ghost, a product of the, if they are a product merely of man's soul winning methods, formulas, or, or ways of operating, then they're a work of man and they're going to have bad fruit, fruit that withers. It's not, if they're a work of God, they're going to produce God's fruit. Take your Bible and go to Isaiah 61, verse 3. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Trees of righteousness. A right tree. If listen, if someone is a work of God, they'll produce God's fruit. They're bad trees. They're bad ground. Go to Psalm 1. Psalm 1. Psalm 1. Anything but the heart, buddy. Anything but the heart. Anything but the heart. Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Someone planted by rivers of water, planted in things of God, their leaf won't wither. But this crowd here, Listen, they're described as uh, trees whose fruit withereth. Go to Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17, verse number 5. Jeremiah 17, verse number 5. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. But he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good for, uh, cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, and the salt land, and not inhabited. Blessed is the man 
that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the, river, by the waters and that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit, the fruit, the fruit of his doings. Amen. That's what the Lord Jesus talked about in Matthew 7. <coughs> Brethren, <coughs> the fruit of something. The fruit of something. Oh, they're a tree, but not necessarily a tree of the Lord's planting, not his work. Take your Bible. Go to Luke 8. Luke 8. Verse 6, Luke 8, verse 6, and some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered. The reason I'm using these verses is because the trees whose fruit withered, it withered away because it lacked moisture. Go to verse 13. They on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy, and these have no root, which for a while believe, and a time of temptation fall away. Look at verse 15. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit, bring forth fruit with patience. Of those four grounds, only one on produces salvation. From everything I see in that thing, only one produces salvation. So, uh, brethren, there says whose trees whose fruit withereth. Then it says without fruit. Go to Galatians 5. <clears throat> Galatians 5. Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit. Brethren, if someone is born of the Spirit of God, they have to produce God's fruit somewhere, sometime in their life. When I first started pastoring, the first year I started pastoring, the Lord set the tone. The Lord set the tone and it's not changed for over 35 years now. He set the tone. I can remember the time when he started setting it in my mind because I saw, I saw people when we were still in the apartment complex on Dorchester Road. People were coming, made profession, had been in other churches. And I saw individuals that would do anything externally you told them to do. Anything outwardly, they were all for it. They would conform to anything that you preached hard upon. But I noticed, that first year I noticed, any time I touched on anything having to do with the fruits of the Spirit, they'd get nervous, look around, try to get distracted. And the Lord got my attention. Notice, son, notice, 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 look, look. You better put the emphasis on those things that only I can do. If you emphasize things that anybody can do in the power of their flesh, nobody will ever discover their self. But if somebody's to see their self, you better, you better put the emphasis on those things that only I can do. And I determined to do it. Because listen, the fruit of the Spirit, it's the, it's the Spirit's fruit. What is it? Love. Love. Brother, why is it that why is it? Listen, I know that I know that most of your Methodists, especially today, I know they're messed up. I know they're messed up. Most of your Assembly of God, most of your I know there's bad doctrine, I know there's stuff. But brethren, what group is noted mainly a lot of times as being mean? Independent Baptist. Brethren, I wouldn't change a thing. I know the doctrine's correct. I know that it, we're not shouldn't be involved in a convention and the kind of thing. But I'll be. So often, what the the, the outstanding characteristics is not just mean spirited, bragging on it, <laughs> bragging on it. The fruit of the spirit is love. Oh, I understand. I understand the lovey dovey stuff. But I've heard that so much. I've heard that so much justified. Oh, the lovey dovey. I got that. But man, to be totally devoid of any of it? The fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy. 
<laughs> joy, peace, long suffering. Sometimes so called Bible believers can be the most impatient. Those ready to, hey, gentleness. Brethren, my observance through the years has been that preachers can be some of the most ungentle people there are. Something's wrong with this. Something's wrong with this. This is not right. Brethren, the pastor that I had coming up, his doctrine wasn't sound on some things. Wesley Methodist Church. Got no problem at all about that guy being saved and loving the Lord. But, But you know what? But you know what? Man, if I had a question, that man really, you could tell he meant it. That was the most important thing in the world at that moment. Helping a little child understand something. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. Yet often when I run into bible preachers, they ain't got time for you. It's almost like you're, it's almost like you're, it's almost like you're bothering them. Or a question is a challenge. And they ain't got time. That man, I never forgot it. And some I never, I never forgot and never wanted to not be a part of my life. I remember that. Gentleness. Goodness. Faith. Meekness. Meekness? Temperance. Against such there is no law. Boy, I know dispensations. No, you need to work on your dispositions. So the dispensations. And I got it. I'm bored like I got it. But look, fruit of the Spirit. This crowd here, it says without fruit. Brethren, if there's never no evidence of any of this, something's wrong somewhere. Something's wrong. Do you know why many times Bible-believing independent Baptist preachers and churches are popular people? Because the spirit that they often put forth makes somebody feel more akin to their flesh. And like, wow, I, here's a place I can go to church and justify some of the attitudes I get. Instead of being com- convicted of it and realize I need to get it out of my life. Now, I'm just being honest. And brethren, look, me and, my, me and brother Mike Lofton, he was, he was saved, he, well, he wasn't saved there, but he had brought up in a Wesley Methodist church too. And he said, brother, I said, he was telling me something. I said, I know what you're going to say. Go ahead and say it. I knew what he was going to say. He's, and I knew it. He's like, brother, I know that that doctrine wasn't correct, but I said, go ahead. But she, I said, brother, but you saw holiness and godliness and you saw attitudes that lined up with the Bible, yet people with the right doctrine Almost devoid of it. He goes, exactly. I said, I know. And it ought not be. But then God put me where I need to be to get my doctrine correct. But the, the same token, I didn't want to lose the right things that I saw. Rather than that, look, that men like Wesley and Whitefield and that, and who maybe their doctrine wouldn't sound like eternal truth. But I tell you what, brethren, they understood holiness. They understood godliness and a walk with God. All right, so watch this. <clears throat> Without fruit... It says next, twice dead. Twice dead? Go to Second Peter 2. Second Peter 2. Verse 19. I'm telling you, brother, some people responded... To independent Baptist churches because they they realize, wow, here's a place I can go to church and use the same kind of language that I thought was wrong, but it's okay to use. I can call black people certain names and it's okay. Brother, that happened. That happened. I can call them certain names and well, I guess it's okay. Brethren. The Sadducees. Pharisees, but brethren, the Pharisees, Jesus told his disciples, they sit in Moses' seat and all that they bid you observe and do, that observe and do. Because they, they had their doctrine more correct than any other group. They really did. But Jesus said, don't do as they do, for they say and do not. And Jesus blasted the Pharisees. Their doctrine was more sound than other groups, but they were full of hypocrisy. 
and they did not have a personal understanding of God in the right sense. Second Peter 2, look at verse 19. While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to have turned to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But they didn't get saved. The whole context there is Second Peter 2. That's not a crowd that got saved. It's that crowd over there with that, remember that ground we looked at? They, they immediately with joy received it, yet had no root in themselves. As part of that ground, that yeah, they, they, they responded. Brethren, that crowd that immediately received it with joy is like Simon in Acts 8. Yeah, okay. Believed, was baptized, lost. The heart was not there. If that's the crowd spoken of in Second Peter, First John two, Book of Jude, verse twenty two. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb: the dog is turned to his own vomit again. Still a dog, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire, still a hog. Not one of God's sheep, not a new creature. All right, look here. Plucked up by the roots. Go to Matthew fifteen. <clears throat> Plucked up by the roots. Matthew 15. Verse 12. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be what? Rooted up. What did you just read the book of Jude? Plucked up by the roots. Well, according to Jesus, who is it that gets rooted up? Those which his father didn't plant. They're not saved. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall in the ditch. Brethren, if, if you can't help someone, you can always pray for them. But there comes a time, let them alone. Jesus said, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Brethren, they've been exposed to truth. They've heard. They know. Pray for them. If God gives you an opportunity, fine. But they've got to decide whether they want to really see their self in truth or keep hiding behind their false pretensions. Take your Bible. Go to uh, 1 John 2. Plucked up by the roots. First John 2. <clears throat> you know the best things you can do? Live a life in front of an individual that demonstrates the power of God, the fruit of God, so that they can look in comparison and see that something is amiss. Brethren, if you, if you, unless the Lord tells you to, if you just go and confront it yourself, somebody's going to put up a defensive thing. No, that ain't me. That ain't me. That's not me. That's not me. Okay. You ain't going to get nowhere. But live so clean and holy and right in front of them that as they start examining you, they see you've got something they ain't got. Yea, verily. That's what the Bible says, that a way a woman to win her husband, if anybody not the word, that also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, wives while they behold your chaste conversation. A couple will fear. They're looking like, oh, you got something I ain't got. What's that difference? Look here. First John 2. Look at verse number 18. <clears throat> Little children, it is the last time. And, it, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. Okay. That's where you're going to have from. Remember, they feast with you without fear. They get involved in church things. They participate in church things. Lord's Supper, they went out from us, but they were not of us. They were not plantings of the Lord. Brethren, if that was true then, then especially in Laodicea, when salvation has become merely a formality, a form, a method, then we can see this, I believe, definitely multiplied over and over. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. What does it say next about them? It says, um, raging waves of the sea. 
Jude verse 13 says, raging waves of the sea. The word raging in the dictionary is defined as acting with violence or fury. It means impetuous, fierce, hasty. Go to 2 Peter 2. 2 Peter 2. Verse 17. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a what? A tempest. To whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. Clouds that are carried with a tempest. The word tempest is defined as violent agitation. Not a peaceable, but just a violent agitation. Their, their, their life is 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 is. Is one that they they are raging waves of the sea, turmoil, turmoil, and just casting up mire and just agitated and just 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 as we're going to see in a minute, foaming out their own shame. There's a there's a tempestuous manner about them and their lives. There's not calmness. There's not calmness. There's not steadiness. Raging waves of the sea. Go to Isaiah 57. <clears throat> Isaiah 57. Verse 20. Isaiah 57, verse 20. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest. Whose waters cast up what? Mire and dirt. You stir such a one up and dirt's going to start coming up. Brother, the saint of God, what you are is going to be revealed when the pressure comes on. These, these they're like, the, the wicked are like the troubled sea, which, look, cannot rest. They can't be still. They cannot rest. They can't just be calm. They've got to have something going on. They can't rest. Whose waters cast up mire and dirt, there is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Uh, what does it say next about them in the book of Jude? Raging waves of the sea, foaming out, foaming out their own shame. The word foaming is defined in the dictionary as frothing, fuming, like a mad dog. Like a mad dog. Go to Philippians 3. And bear with me here. Philippians 3. Philippians 3, verse 19. Foaming out their own shame, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Brethren, things they ought to be ashamed of, listen, their glory is in their shame. They mind earthly things. They are, they are carnally minded and not spiritually minded. Now, sometimes a saint, a true saint can fall prey to that. But this crowd, they're carnally minded because that's the only mind they've got. <clears throat> Go to Proverbs 11. <clears throat> Proverbs 11. Proverbs 11, verse 2. Foaming out their own what? Shame. Look at Proverbs 11, 2. When pride cometh, then cometh shame. And with the lowly is wisdom. So what's involved here? Pride. Foaming out their own shame. When pride cometh, then cometh shame. There's a pride issue here. Go to Proverbs 12, <clears throat> verse 16. A fool's wrath is presently known. They can't control their self. But a prudent man covereth shame. Brethren, a prudent man says, I gotta control myself because I'm gonna, I'm gonna behave in a, I'm gonna, if I'm not careful, I'm gonna behave in a shameful manner. I've gotta control myself. That's what a prudent man does. He covers his shame. Because brethren, okay, look. What marks an adult? They can control their self. What marks a kid, a baby, a toddler? They gotta have a diaper. Because they can't control their self. They have no control. All right, listen. But then some people, some grown-ups almost need an emotional diaper. Because they can't control their self. They are not mature. Look, a fool's wrath is presently known. No control. 
No control. A prudent man covereth shame. He controls himself. He don't want to shame himself by showing himself to be a child by his lack of control. Take your Bible. Go to Isaiah 47. <clears throat> Isaiah 47. Verse 3. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance, and I will not meet thee as a man. Thy shame shall be seen. Thy na- Brethren, when you can't control yourself, brethren, your nakedness is seen, your shame is seen when you uncover yourself. Brethren, when you can't have rightful self-control, you uncover yourself to your shame. Now, brethren, there's a right, there's a, listen, the Lord Jesus got angry. He cleaned house. There's a right place and a right time for things, but it better be done in holiness and in righteousness and the power of the Spirit of God. Go to Jeremiah 13. Foaming out their own shame like a mad dog. Jeremiah 13. Verse 26. Therefore will I discover thy skirts upon thy face, that thy shame may, may appear. You know what? Lord knows how to bring a thing home. Israel has given themselves to others. The Lord says, okay, I'll discover thy skirts upon thy face that thy shame may appear. Does it say, I'll pull your garments over your head and I'll let your shame be seen? Shouldn't bother you. You've, you've revealed yourself to everybody that passes by. Why does that bother you? Because they did that for their own pleasure in their own way. But now the Lord's doing it in judgment. And it's not a pretty sight. Friend, the Lord knows how to expose us if we don't have the right kind of restraint and the right kind of order to our lives. Go to Hosea 4. Hosea 4. Verse 18. Their drink, their drink is sour. They have committed whoredom continually. Her rulers with shame do love give ye. Boy, if that is not like today. What, what, what do people got a bad taste in their mouth about? TV evangelists, TV preachers, any preacher who get, what's their, what's their call? Give ye, give ye, give ye, give ye. Look here. Real quick. A couple, two more verses here with this part. Go to Ephesians 5. And I'll say this, foam me out the rain shame, do love give ye. I don't know, I don't know if it goes on still because I stayed away from stuff, but there would be times I know, of meetings to where brother, that plate would continue to get passed until they felt like they got enough money. I do not know how in the world you can reconcile that to the word of God. I cannot, I cannot figure, I can't, how you can read the Bible and justify that. But it gets done. It's the way you're supposed to operate. I told you, uh, I, I learned a lesson early on about that. We had just, just started pastoring, was asked to a meeting uh, up in the mountains. And the guy said, come up here, we'll put, put the preachers up, you know, and just a time to get away. And just, I hadn't been pastoring long, went up there. And so they're sitting there, didn't have hardly any. Thing. I mean, we didn't. We didn't have hardly anything. And it almost seemed choreographed. Because what happened was, somebody stood up, had the pastor sit down, and then this brother stood behind the pulpit and blasted everybody. I'll tell you what, you come to something like this, and everybody tells you, you know, this don't just happen for nothing. This thing costs money. And we got to, so the pastor can sit there, like he's not doing it, but the money raiser guy, I... Maybe it wasn't choreographed, but I'll be it smelt like it. Like this is how you do it. And so he stands up. All right, we got to take an offering here. We got to get this. Everybody, come on. You enjoyed it. You liked we stayed that, didn't you? You liked. And I was like, wow, really? 
Seriously. Wow. Giving should be done not by necessity. So you're going to ask somebody something, but then you put the preacher down, so you get him down, so he's not really the one doing it. I, I'm, I'm doing it for him. I feel led to do it. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. I, maybe so. It just had a funny smell. You know what? But then what happens is, meetings get put on. We've got to pay for this. So then you start getting on the people. I'm sorry, brother. I'm sorry. I can't find it. I can't find it. Do love, do shame, do love, give ye. Ephesians 5, look at verse 11. <clears throat> and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Brother, some things you're not supposed to talk about. There's some ungodly things that people do. I don't want to know about them. I don't want to know about it. I don't need to know about it. I don't want to. Brethren, I, I didn't run across enough stuff in my life. I wish I could get out of that. I don't want to know about it. I don't need to know about it. All right? Look at Romans 6. Romans 6. <clears throat> Brethren, when I was in the military, there was a class we had to go to. I forgot what it was. And they, were, and, they, and they were sending around some pictures of somebody who had committed suicide. And when it came to me, I was like, I passed it on. And the guy said, what? Afraid to look at it? Don't look at it. I said, nope, don't look at it. Why don't I want to look at it? Why, like, why would you want to look at it? There was some kind of demented, sick thing that went around in the 80s that I heard people in my shop talk about called the faces of death. And I guess it was a video or something of people. Brethren, that's sick. That's unclean. What kind of morbid, sick desire would have you? Well, it's twisted. It's demonic to glory in something like that. There's something unclean about that kind of thing. All right? Life is life. I get it. But that's your entertainment? That's to sit around? I get it. Mm -mm. Brethren, that's a mark of unregeneracy or someone who's saved but not where they ought to be walking with the Lord. Look here. Romans 6, verse 21. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. <clears throat> Brethren, the older I get, the less I even want to think about anything in my life that was contrary to God. Go back real quick now, real quick. Book of Jude. Book of Jude. Verse 13. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Look, wandering stars. What are wandering stars? That's uh, a Bible name also for planets. The Bible mentions planets, but wandering stars are the planets. Here's why. Here's here's how we know that. In fact, you need to look at the dictionary. Beliefs now: the wandering stars or planets are wandering stars. If you go out in the night sky, the way that you can tell a star from a planet is this: number one, stars twinkle; planets don't. If you look at a star long enough, especially out of the corner of your eye, where you're, I think it's the rods or the cones, they twinkle. Stars twinkle. You look at them, look at a, look at a, look at a star on a clear night, and you'll see it change color. Most of the time we just glance, but if you'll look, a star changes color. It'll go blue, green sometimes. Uh, you got to stare at it, but it'll do that. But they twinkle. Planets do not twinkle. They're, they're just there. They don't twinkle. Stars are always in the same fixed position. Here's what I mean. <clears throat> if you go out tonight and you see, uh, you won't see Orion tonight. Let's see, you see uh, 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 Sagittarius. Or you see, you see Scorpio. That's a good one that lights up in the sky. If you go out and see it tonight, next year, same date, same time of night, 9 o'clock, you'll see the same thing. And and you'll see it tomorrow. You'll see it in the same position in the sky, though maybe thirty minutes later tomorrow night. Stars are in relation to each other. Stars are fixed. But if you see a bright star, it's not twinkling, so you know it's not a star. And then, and tomorrow night you see it in a different relative position. In other words, you take the star serious. It's going to always be in the same position to Orion. To Taurus, it's going to always be in the same position. Always, no matter time of year. It's going to move in the same relative position to the other stars. 
But if Mars or Jupiter's out, it'll be here. Next night it'll be there. The next night it'll be there. They, they wander. So wandering stars are the planets. Because plan, planets have no fixed, stationary, predictable, trustworthy position. I mean, people who've studied them can kind of predict, but not like you can with the stars. They, there's no fixed position. They're, they're, they, they move around. These are wandering stars. Once again, they're not fixed. They're unstable. They don't stick with the Bible, church, the things of God. They are unstable, up and down, in and out, all over the place. Do you understand? Wandering stars, not fixed. Brethren, someone that's saved should have a fixedness to their life. A stability to them. I'm not saying you can't get in the flesh. And I understand that. But brethren, there should be at least the potential for that. But the lost person, even if they're religious, they don't have that potential. And they just end up all over the place. Uh, caring about winds of doctrine. Moving here, there, all over the place. Here, there. No fixed, definite consistency. And this is the last part, but it's heavy. To whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. They're lost. They're unregenerate. Go to Second Peter two, verse seventeen. Again, <clears throat> these are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. And finally, Revelation twenty one. Verse 8, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Fearful and unbelieving. Fearful and unbelieving. Wow. What were they afraid of? What were they afraid of? Afraid of what salvation might cost them? Afraid of what, afraid of what God might call them to do. Afraid of what they might have to give up. Afraid of what others would say about them. Afraid of being called names. Afraid of being, losing relationships. Afraid of telling the truth about their self. You know the danger of religion? <clears throat> Here's the danger of religion. When you're religious, people think you're righteous. And when you know you're not, now you've got the added hardship of admitting I'm not what you think I am. And that's hard. Do you understand? Brent, the, the reason what makes religion, the change of religion so hard is because people think that you're righteous when you're only religious. Then when you realize that you're not righteous, you realize you're not born again. Now everybody thinks you are. Now added to, added to just facing yourself is the embarrassment you think that everybody's going to think or the shame you're going to feel in front of them. That's a lie. Because true people who love the Lord won't disdain you for it. They'll love you for your honesty. They'll embrace you. They'll never think twice about it. <clears throat> but the devil will use that to play on your mind and use your pride to, facing, to keep you from facing the truth about yourself. That's a horrible thing. That crowd in the book of Jude... It's, let, me, let me say this. It's not so much your, for lack of a better way to put it, it's not so much your average lost person. These are religious leaders. These are religious. That crowd in, in 2 Peter 2 and in Jude, they are religious leaders who have gone the way of Cain and, uh, uh, and, and, after the way of, uh, and, and ran after the way of uh, Balaam for reward. They realized I can make a living off this religious stuff. I can make it work for me. So it's not just it's not just your average lost person. Not, understand what I mean by that. These are those who creep in trying to lead people astray. And they're lost. And the Bible describes them. And we better understand. Now, don't get me wrong. It also can apply to the average lost person. But understand the context of who it's really talking about. Why do we need to know that? Some people need to know it so they can maybe see their own self. We need to know it so we can be aware and we can distinguish them when they try to creep in. Because try to creep in, they will do. 
And when you see these kind of signals, you don't go up to somebody and say, you're lost. <laughs> you pray for them. You be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. Be very watchful and pray and pray, pray that God would help them to uh, see their self. Let me close with one thing. Somebody years ago got in touch with me about the situation of their church. It was a church they were going to and, 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 and to them it was pretty obvious there were some false people there. Just glaringly some. And they were thinking about going in and addressing it and I said I said well, well first of all that's the pastor's deal for the most part but I said brother I said listen if you're not careful you'll do some great damage I said I said please listen to me listen to me I said you're perceiving that some things are amiss and that possibly there's some folks that are lost I said you wouldn't be surprised if you're, if you're right you're probably right I said well, brother here's the problem Jesus told a parable about a man who had some wheat, good grain, and the enemy sowed tares. And next thing you know, they'd grown up together. And pretty soon you could tell the difference. After a while, it came obvious. So the servants came and said, Lord, you want to root them up? He said, no, no, no. By this point, the roots have got all mixed together down there, and you'll pull up the good stuff with the bad. You start jerking up. And you're going to pull up the wheat too. Let them grow. And we'll separate it out at harvest. You see, brethren, listen. If you and I don't handle things wisely, if we start uprooting. Brethren, you know what happens when you first get saved? Shoot. If anybody's, if anybody's a member of the church, if anybody's going to church, you think everybody's saved and loves God. You just love everybody. Brethren, when you're saved, you're just so full of Jesus that you just think everything's good and right and everybody loves one another. And this thing's the most greatest thing it's ever been. And you take somebody brand new like that, and you start uprooting folks, they, they're, you're going to blow their mind. And you're going to do hurtful damage to them, especially somebody new in the Lord. And not always just somebody new in the Lord. Why? Because underneath, those roots are together, and you start pulling up one, you're going to uproot even the good. Now, brethren, not saying that you don't deal with heresy and, and public sin. Not saying that. But when you start dealing with matters of wheat and tares and somebody that's looks like they're starting to manifest that they're not true you just pray that god would help them to see what they are and become new creatures because if they don't the lord settle it all out in a reaping time that's us pray father thank you lord for this time give us understanding help us lord to take these things to heart that we might be aware and watchful in the day and hour that we're in for those who would creep in and lord try to bring up people and hurt and damage. Father, we ask this in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen.